Hello and welcome to the first episode of The Follycast. This is Margaret in Sutton, Richard in Fulham, Jan in Worcester and Jenny in Muswell Hill. The Follycast is a new podcast series in which we'll be looking at the Rivers of London series by Ben Aronovich, which follows the adventures of rookie PC Peter Grant who finds himself dragged deeper and deeper into a whole supernatural side of London that's hidden in plain sight. To date, there are eight books as well as a couple of novellas and some graphic novels which we may investigate at a later date. But our initial focus is the core series of books. Our plan is to spend a podcast focused on each of the books in turn. We'll be recording the podcast about a month apart to let new readers read up for each episode. So the first book gives its name to the series of Rivers of London. We have both read the subsequent series, so to give it a new perspective, we are joined by two friends as our scientific control group. Neither Jan nor Jenny had read the series, nor indeed were even aware of the Rivers of London until we actually recruited them. A couple of housekeeping points before we kick off. This podcast will assume that you've read the first book, Rivers of London, and will discuss major plot points and spoilers. Whilst each book in the series does have a distinct separate story, there's also an overarching ongoing story that builds across the series, rather like a season of a TV show builds towards its season finale. We won't be discussing spoilers for the following books in the series with Jenny and Jan, but for long-term fans of the series, at the end of the podcast, Richard and I will enter a special hidden library at the Folly in which we will break out the spoilers on those topics we had to bite our lips about earlier on. In the first episode, to create a sense of dramatic tension, we haven't asked Jan and Jenny how much they like the book. So towards the end, we'll be asking them if they like Rivers of London enough to read book two, which is called Moon Over Soho, and join us for the next podcast in a month's time. A recent Guardian podcast described the series as what if Gandalf joined the Sweeney? So what genre or blend of genres is the book and how would you describe it to someone? So Jenny, perhaps you want to kick us off? Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about this um, and what it, what was it most like? I don't really read science fiction, but this isn't science fiction. It, it's fantasy, but it's also a sometimes quite straightforward police procedural it's a murder case in london and and it follows the kind of normal arc of a, a murder case so i thought it probably fitted into magic realism which is essentially it's a it's a real story it's anchored in fact but it's just got this level above it of fantasy of magic of psychic phenomenon you know, it's, uh, so I, I find it really hard to pin down. And for a long time, I thought, what is this most like? It kind of goes back to things like Hawksmoor. Oh, right, same yeah. London thing, same murder series, but but a an mm. element of the supernatural sitting on top of it. And who's that, who's that by? absolutely loved. Peter Ackroyd. Who? Oh, yes. Peter Ackroyd. So it's, it, it's a long time ago. But he 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 also got into a bit later rather more supernatural, yes, fiction. So I I think that's probably where it sits for me. It's it's crime supernatural dialed up to eleven in London. Mm. Jan, what do you think? Well, I can see exactly what Jenny means. Also, I don't tend to read fantasy, but I think. I enjoyed this so much because there was that thriller element to it, as if the story was unfolding. And because it was so much set in familiar places and amongst normal people, I think that's the way I was able to really enjoy what I think I've seen described as an urban fantasy novel. I really liked, I quite liked thrillers and sort of crime procedures. But I'm not a great lover of fantasy, although a lot of people around me are major sci-fi fans. <laughs> and had I been presented it as a fantasy novel, I don't think I would have read it. And I think for me, because it was about the history of London, I thought, and the rivers of London, and I'll come on to how I came onto it later on. But going back to that point about Peter Ackroyd, he's written some really good books about London generally. And that sort of, that's kind of how I fitted in. But the sort of mixture of 
actuality of things happening in real time in the sense that it's in London and London that you know and it's very rooted in that but is crime but has that sort of level of magic and mm. wit no, we call it whimsy but you know it's not just the sort of science bit but it's also the rivers themselves as embodiments of people mm. I found really fascinating so it's, it's it's difficult to pin down just in one genre I would say what do you think Richard? It's interesting Jenny mentions the police procedural because yes. I know having yeah, heard interviews with him that he he did a lot of research around that. At the time I read the book, I didn't know that. and So I was quizzing a friend of mine who works for the police and saying, is there this thing really called Holmes? He had named after <laughs> yeah. Sherlock Holmes. And he said, yeah, there's there. And I read him a few more of the... He said, yeah. He said, oh, what is this book? It sounds, you know, they sound like they know what they're talking about because I think he did have uh, contacts in the police to talk to him about how that whole procedural element would work. I mean, for my... my my references would be slightly less literary than Peter Ackroyd. I'd, I'd probably describe it as effectively Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets Luther. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 That's good. Because, but Buffy has been a, a, a huge influence on the way a lot of TV's been done, and like Russell T Davis acknowledged that with the new Doctor Who, in terms of the banter, the, the light-hearted tone, the, the humorous way in which people speak. But also, more specifically, if you've watched the show, it's about a young girl being taught how to become a slayer by an older guy with a potentially a darker past who lives in a library and has got very fusty ideas and doesn't agree with anything mm. that happened after 1960. So, yeah, I think that's how I'd describe it. It's interesting. Um, we we hope we're going to get feedback if we get listeners to the show can get in touch with us about their feelings about the book. We we did have one early bit of feedback from Emma, who hopefully is listening. It's a desperate attempt to have at least one listener. And said, so for me, it was it was how different it was from every other book that she'd read. History, mm. crime and fantasy all in one. So I think it, it's easy, like music, to say you can see the references, but it, I think it is a quite a unique book. I think what's really interesting is that nobody's at this point mentioned Harry Potter books because my other half loves Harry Potter, but this was not his boat at all. So although Peter Grant references it a couple of times, it is a completely different space, I think, it's operating in. It, it is It is very different. It's magic of a whole different mm. genre, really. <laughs> actually was the title it was around lost rivers of london and i previously worked in a building that was over the river fleet we did a project about rivers of london and i was just fascinated by that and as i say i really loved it even though fantasy novels are definitely not my thing if i read it as a commuter book within about 20 minutes i was hooked and i read it over the next two weeks on my way to work and home again but then i said to richard oh i've read this amazing book it's called rivers of london it's absolutely great and he said yeah i've read four already so it wasn't a surprise to richard <laughs> but he hadn't recommended them to me because that's not really the area that I no. tend to to read based on the fact she liked it and then went went on to recommend it to our mother who it absolutely isn't her <laughs> genre and she's probably the biggest fan of the three of us strangely we'll have to get her to do a, an audio record for the podcast at Definitely. some point but Jan what, how far out of your safe space is this book in terms very of what read? <laughs> very far out but I have to say I was hooked on the first page really because I enjoyed the humour yeah. the bit where he said good Samaritanism in London is considered yes. an extreme sport <laughs> I was I was in after that and I think I think I think it's because I'm not a Londoner I have lived in London in the past I do work in London and I loved the city. But I also realised, um, like Jenny, I started then to have a look at some of the books that I really enjoy reading. And they all have a really strong sense of place. Yes. And I yes. think that's what hooked me, as, as well as the humour. It was this sense of, of London, someone that's totally immersed in the city, 
sound as if he knows every inch of it yeah. and yeah. other books that I've read that have that uh, there's a book called Istanbul by a Turkish writer or Pamuk, and there's books by Nadine Gordima a South African writer and again it takes you to those places yeah. and so this in a sort of very different way from what I'm used to but I enjoyed it in that sense of really putting me at the heart of the city that I really like. Book I'm on to London in a moment but I, I have been shopping in that Tesco's Metro in Covent Garden. I have, <laughs> I have eaten in Browns. I have... Uh, that well, little Japanese place in New Road. Yes, yeah. yes, where they meet Meets Nightingale, all of that, you know, the route out of the Royal Opera House, you know, that whole sort of area is just something that I know quite well. And even when they, they sort of go to various parts of London, like Wapping and various other places like that, you really feel that you're in that street with them rather than it's just mm, could be some general yeah. place in London that he's just referring to, so... Shall I move on and talk a little bit about how you all feel about the magic and the super supernatural aspects of the book yeah so I think why I enjoyed it was the fact that you're rooted in sort of normal mundane life Mm. Um, so you don't feel as if you're going into some complete fantasy world that I think I perhaps would find difficult to be completely invested in here everything is normal and then suddenly these extraordinary things happen and I think also what made it work for me was that obviously um, we've got the main characters that uh, that have this sort of gift um, but all the the sort of police officers in general yes. that think it's all a nonsense, but they do accept that, yeah, we know this is going on. We don't really want to be involved in it. And mm. I think so all of yeah. that made it seem all very plausible, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I'd go along with that completely. It's a layer above what's happening normally. And all the, all the other officers, they, uh, they may be the only ones in the know, but they follow up and they pursue and they work alongside these people it's not seen as a kind of separate loony tunes place no. i mean they are yeah. they are yeah. as they would be with all of their colleagues rude at times but <laughs> it, it is it is part of you know the normal life I mean, Jen, jenny you were i think in a past conversation you were saying you weren't desperately keen on the descriptions of how the magic worked and that element of it is um, that still the case or? yeah it is and i'm i'm also a bit dubious about the newton connection hold that thought i'm just i'm just less interested in what it takes to uh, you know what you what you yeah. call a ball of light and what happens to it you know it just just doesn't really fascinate me um, but the fact is that we had to have those there because they were going to be used. So we had to have mm. the spells. It's, for, from my perspective, it, I, I, I'm not a big fan of... Although I'm a sci-fi fan, I'm not really a fantasy fan. And I, I've mm. never read Lord of the Rings. I don't watch Game of Thrones. Um, not just because it's fantasy, cause, because it's pretty gory. But um, <laughs> but what I do enjoy... Is, I, I, I don't know if it's a parallel, but... Um, I really loved a show that on TV that was on a few years ago called The Sons of Anarchy, which was about a motorcycle gang in Northern California. I hate motorcycles. I've no desire to be in a motorcycle gang. But what I liked about it was you get to explore the rules of, it, of, of a way of behaviour and, and how that little mini society worked in terms of how they interacted with the other gangs. And that, I, I kind of liked that element of it even though i'm not interested in magic or motorcycles i, I quite like the unfolding of this is how it works if you see what i mean that, that i quite I, like i'm unpacking that or in, in sci-fi terms it's sometimes referred to as world building that you're building this way that a new society that mm. star trek visits on a planet works and how the people interact so yeah i, I, I can see it. that because there was a sort of formality to way um everything worked you'd got mm. the the strict ways that the sort of magic had to be learned and carried out yeah. and also alongside I thought it sitted very nicely alongside uh, the police procedures that had yeah. to follow a certain yeah. format so that mm. almost everybody knew how everyone was supposed to behave yeah. and then that's when the sort of 
thunderbolts were thrown in, it threw everything into sort of chaos. But sometimes we didn't we didn't get to hear or we didn't get to learn maybe yet what some of those things are. So we we hear about agreements. We hear yes. about when things have gone wrong. We know we know that everything is codified, but we don't know how or why. Um, so I suspect there's quite a lot we still have to learn. Oh yeah, so yeah. coming up. <laughs> we won't go any further. No, that's, that takes us into spoilers, and we're not doing spoilers at the moment. The novel features quite a lot of graphic and violent horror elements. I mean, it starts off with quite a violent murder. How did you feel about all of those sort of aspects of the book? Because it is quite grisly in parts. Well, I think I was fine with it initially, you know, when the, the, the head had rolled away from the body on the first page. But I think because of the way it was described, it felt quite sort of jokey and mm. tongue in cheek yeah. um, and it felt almost like a little bit of a romp it's it, <laughs> it felt very much almost like a police report so it felt as if the policeman was describing what had happened in a very matter of fact way but as you'd imagine people work in the police probably doctors in hospitals um, sometimes have this black humour and I yeah. thought that was the way it was being described until we came up to the point mm. um, where they came across Mr Coopertown and oh, gosh, yes. what was going on there. I think that was the bit when I thought it suddenly, the tone suddenly changed and it became really quite graphic and and serious but then it did sort of come quickly out of it so then it so it didn't feel gratuitous like some books and films can when they're describing something very grisly i think it's funny you mentioned that that bit because i was thinking back obviously margaret and i reread the book um to prepare for the podcast i read it I think 2012, uh, about two years after it came out. I nearly stopped reading at, at that point in the book yeah. because I hadn't read it before. I wasn't so sure what sort of book it was going to be. I was quite enjoying the light, you know, not light-hearted, but you know, the sardonic nature of it. Yeah. And then suddenly, you know, people's faces start exploding in graphic detail. And I, I actually put it down for a day or two. I thought I'm, that's not that's not my sort of book. I don't know why I picked it up again. Obviously, I'm, I'm glad I did. But I don't like horror. Yeah, I'm the same. I, I, in fact, I probably speed read through those scenes, yeah. which meant I didn't actually understand what was going on. And mm. that became quite critical to understand. So I had to go back and read them again. It's indicative of the attempt to make the magic seem real and, and linked to yeah. actual physics. You often see face swap things in sci-fi where people's faces swap and then yeah. magically they all go back to normal. This was trying to say, well, if that did happen to someone, there would be physical Isn't consequences yeah. of what rearranging someone's face was so I, I in hindsight I now get it and I, I see why it's there and I probably wouldn't take it out I mean I am I'm a complete wuss so you know <laughs> most readers are I, I was saying to Margaret I, I still I've t three times I've tried to watch Alien but I've never made it past the moment when John Hurt's mm -mm. stomach starts to ripple and you know what's coming <laughs> and I'm out so uh, um yeah, it does make me wonder how they would do that if it became a TV show, but we'll come on to yeah. that. It's interesting, Jan mentioned that she was hooked from the first page. Was that the case with the rest of you? I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as being hooked. I did spend the first half wondering where it was going. Hmm. Um, you know, going with it and, and liking it as I went along, but I couldn't quite see what was what was happening and then there was that big reveal uh, in the middle of the book that when I suddenly went oh okay uh, but also that made it that made it kind of link again to the the traditional crime arc so it, it mm. then became okay this is where this is where all of these stories get to when mm. somebody has they don't have to be magic you know all moody detectives stand and look at crime scenes and stare and stare and stare and then suddenly get a light bulb moment this was exactly the same it just happened to be a magic or um, supernatural light bulb moment i i wouldn't say i was hooked from the first page but i liked the tone of it and i liked the way that how sort of sardonic and ironic peter was as a person you know for somebody so young his view mm. of the world and how the police worked and where he fitted into that world was quite interesting. Where it clicked into place 
for me was probably not a not a major scene but it was when Peter creates his sort of uh, den above the car park at the Folly and mm. there's a scene where they're watching the TV you know having just moved into the den and, and Leslie's there and Beverly and Molly comes in and the dog's there and then Nightingale sticks his head around the corner and they're all watching TV and, and that was when I kind of clicked I, th- I thought oh I get this that's the team that's the yeah. th- these yeah. are the characters that have now coalesced together yeah. Yeah. if this goes on to further books perhaps who knows um, obviously there's a big question mark over Leslie now but um, yeah the, the, I, I get where I get <laughs> yeah. where this I get where this is going <laughs> You know, yeah. it might it might be my TV brain kicking in, but it was almost my TV brain thinking. <laughs> so that's the logo, isn't it? It's the final yeah. one. Yeah, and if this have o- if if this has opening credits, who's going to yes. be in them? And it's going to, you know, those little ten second shots of people, you know, starring Leslie, starring. So it's like the um, fantasy friend sofa, but not yes. in the coffee shop. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so it, like it, it yeah. appealed to my sense of neatness. I was like, right, I understand this now. Okay, let's carry on and have an adventure. <laughs> I, I hadn't got that, but now you mention it, yeah. That's... So let's let's think a little bit more about characters because we talked about it, about all of those ones that are on the sofa. So, which characters did you particularly enjoy or identify or want to come back? So I think Nightingale, because mm-hmm. he was quite a distinctive character. But and even though you saw a fair amount of him, I felt he sort of remained elusive. So. I think there's a lot more to know about him. Exactly. Whereas I felt that with Peter and even Leslie to a certain degree, they were quite clearly drawn. So you mm. felt you got a good sense of them, particularly Peter. Mm. And the character, I think, was Lady Ty. Yes, um, brilliant. <laughs> because some of the other sisters I wasn't particularly interested in but she was so different and a bit anarchic and feeling you know we've got to move with the times we've got to and and yet didn't see enough of her so I'm hoping that in future books she puts in more of an appearance because she looks as if she's big trouble so yeah I like Peter as the narrator because it's all seen through his eyes but you know, I'm quite interested, Nightingale, I find quite interesting, the whole sort of backstory and history of him. But also I'm quite intrigued by Molly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that Molly is somebody we also get to know more about. Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I like yeah. Beverly. Wait, well, yeah. But the, what, the reason I like Beverly more than anything else is because she's a, she's still a real river. Beverly yes. Brook is still a real river, whereas Lady Ty yes. is buried underground or turned into a sewer, as yep. most of them were. No, Beverly Brook runs through Kingston, New Malden, yeah, down that exactly. A3. <laughs> well, someone that Jenny and I know, uh, a guy called Brian Jacobs, uh, I was having a chat with on, on Skype, and he he was relating his lockdown walk. I went for a walk with Beverly Brook. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that, he went, he'd went. he been for a walk along Beverly Brook. Uh, it clearly runs down it must run down to Putney doesn't it again I didn't realize how much she was in the first book and that I've really yeah. enjoyed actually because I do like her mm. as a character so uh, that was quite pleasing to me you f- you forget sometimes because you focus on the main bit of yeah. the story mm. how pivotal she actually is in the book well our first listener Emma um, votes for Peter who says I like his humor down to earth and matter of fact nature I had high hopes for a relationship with Leslie but sadly things didn't turn out so great <laughs> <for the laughs> Although he, he, he did save her life. So. Yes. I think I found some of the bits when they were going out of town and meeting the family of Mother Thames and Father Thames, although I know they're important, I think I was very happy to get back to the main story because I couldn't quite see, apart from the Lady Ty bits, I wasn't as interested in what they were up to as I was with what was going on with the main characters in the story. You know when you, if you watch a soap or something, uh, thinking of something like Friends, uh, 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 to go back to Margaret's reference, when they left 
Manhattan and went out and did something else. I was always, oh, just get back to Manhattan. This is just a sideline and it's not as much fun. I think I felt that about it, really. It's interesting, for the first few books, they promoted it as the PC Grant series. Um, ah. But they now are very much, uh, from what I can see from the marketing, doubling down on Rivers of London as being the series. Yeah. Um, to the extent that we, in America, when they released the first book, it was called Midnight Riot rather than yeah. Rivers of oh. London, presumably in anticipation of that. Can I make a sort of side point? I think if you read the actual blurb for the first book, it doesn't really do it justice to what the book is, and it's quite no. all about him fancying Leslie. Or wanting to get in her pants, it yeah. says, which, which put like, me oh. off. I thought that would put me, <laughs> yeah, put me off a bit because it that's, that that sounds a bit like you know um, yeah. one of those sort of young young adult novels. Certainly, the blurb on Amazon, which is repeated on quite a lot of websites, as you say, oh, isn't really? particularly. I don't think it was particularly. And he, he does actually. But I, I'm surprised. And, and not that it's not wouldn't be wouldn't have been written by him, so he might not have had much influence no. over the blurb. But you think that the, the publisher would be aware of it though? I mean, it's it's not disastrous. Yeah. It's just doesn't. No. It, yeah, doesn't do it yeah. as Margaret says. It doesn't do it justice. Maybe that's why I didn't read it in the first place. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Too, too long ago to well, I was going to say school. something I found a bit odd but it feels like at the end you're sort of you've got the bit in the opera house and then you've got the riot in Covent Garden and then you move on to him being bitten by Molly and that whole thing about him going yeah. back in virtual time back to eventually Father Thames and him staking punch and him falling in the river whilst that was interesting and it brought the rivers in and everything else like that it stepped out of the sort of immediacy of the all yeah. of all of this and sort of slaying it down towards the end and then ramping it back up again in terms of yeah, it, was, it was a Leslie. bit of a dramatic um ending wasn't it i called it the folly molly bite time machine <laughs> <laughs> it's a film called hot tub time machine that could be a, a, yeah. a, a sequel yeah. to it. having read rivers of london um, what other books or media would you recommend to fans who like Rivers of London? Apart from the next book, obviously, which is Moon Over Soho. <laughs> yeah, um, I think this uh, the, a more recent writer that I'm massively into is um, David Mitchell. So oh, I just read yeah. Bone Clocks and Slade House, which are connected. I read a fantastic book of his, num a Number Nine Dream, set in Japan, which takes you know everything from cartoons and the yakuza and just ramps them up he's a i think he's a fantastic writer and he's got a new one coming out soon so that's always a good thing i'd find it difficult because it's it's not the type of book as i say that i would normally <laughs> read one thing that did and this was going back many 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 years ago would be kingsley amos and lucky jim not that it's close to it but in the same way it sort of mm. explores academia in a comic way in the same way that this looks at the sort of police force and uh so it's not similar but it made me think of it as a sort of exploring a you know a, a, a career a job um there, i'll have to look up the name of the author and i'll have to insert it later but there's if you are interested in the lost rivers of london there's a really good book about the lost, lost rivers of London because that's something that brought it back to me in terms of how much water is under London and how many lost rivers they are and how they're all connected in the history of them, like the River Fleet and various other things like that. But that's more oh. the, more um, hmm. uh, a non-fiction book. We put all these things in the show notes. Um, so if, <laughs> if, our listener, if our listeners are out jogging on their government-permitted jog, they don't need to stop and take notes. Yeah, just just go idea. to the, uh, <laughs> the notes under the podcast. I, I mean, for my point, I'd, I'd recommend two books, both by authors called Neil, funnily enough. Um, the first one would be Neil Stevenson's Baroque Cycle. It's funny that Jenny mentioned her scepticism about Isaac Newton because the third book in that series which is set uh, back in that in the, the era of Isaac Newton is called The System of the World and it is all about Newton um, his links to the bank uh, setting up the Royal Mint and also specifically him as the founder of modern magic 
Um, oh really? So this is this is a theme that at least two other books I've I've oh. read have returned to. Particularly, he's interested in alchemy because he yeah, wanted that's why to. I assumed it came uh, from. He he thought he could save the national coffers by investigating how to turn you know base metal into gold and therefore. Um, that would ingratiate him with the king. So they're brilliant books. The only drawback, as Margaret will know, I think... Uh, they're um, long! They're about 950 yes. pages each, but they are yeah. absolutely... They're my, they're my, they're my, they're my favourite books. They're my favourite books. The other, the other one, which is a lot shorter, is Neil Gaiman's Neville. Yeah. There. It's brilliant, but, and it has some similarities, not least because it's all about this place called London Below... That the rest of London can't see where a lot of the London tube stations are actual people. Um, so there is a guy. There's a guy called Old Bailey who lives at Old Bailey. There's an Earl who lives at Earl's Court. There's a bridge that uh, you go over at night at Knightsbridge. And there's also a character called the Angel Islington, who, when they made it into a TV show, was played by Peter Capaldi. So, uh, oh really? Um, okay. Oh my yeah. God! Yeah, another Doctor Who connection. Another Doctor Who connection. <laughs> I, I have to... It's also a Muswell Hill connection, but we'll we'll pass that one. In a recent Guardian podcast, and also at the uh, author event that we went to, Ben Aronovich found that a TV series is in development with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, who did Spaced and Shaun of the Dead. I think I'd, I'd be interested to know, though, what if, if it is be, being made into a TV show. I mean, obviously everything's up in the air with the current um, crisis, mm. but what sort of TV show do you think it would need to be to succeed? How would it be pitched? I think you would need to push the humour side mm. of it. Well, and then the surprises is, would be yeah. the sort of gore and horror that appears within it. Interesting you say that, because how would that... Because the gore and the horror will depend whether it's post nine o'clock or not. At the moment, True. if this book was adapted yeah. for TV, yeah. it would be post nine o'clock and lose quite a lot of people who might potentially be interested in it. You know, is it going to be more mm. of a Buffy, Doctor Who sort of show, fun sort of a show? Some of the violence you see off stage almost, or well, it's not to, as, yeah. You'd, have, you'd as... have to infer, yeah. you know. It could be a London X-Files, which would, but that, I think that, that, I hope it isn't. I hope it's not, mm. that, I hope that's not how it's pitched because I don't think that would go down very well. I, uh, I think it entirely depends on which element you think is going to have the most mm. play. Is it the yeah. humour? Is it the crime? Is it the supernatural? For me, the tone will be... I mean, if you take something like Doctor Strange and... and uh, was it Doctor Strange and Mr. Norrell and or Norrell. whatever? Yeah. Um, yeah. That did disastrously on, on television. Yeah. I don't know how good it was, but people just didn't get it. They, yeah, I think no. it's, this overlap, but you know, people's expectations are that this sort of thing should be fun and frothy as opposed to scary and sort of, you know, silent witness type levels of uh, but there are so it, many different strands to it i yes. know that's yeah. why i think that's why i think it is going to be yeah. a challenge if they can crack it it could be really yeah. popular but it's it's clearly going to be a challenge that will be their dilemma how to pitch it won't yeah. it yes as long as they don't pitch it like the blurb on the back of the first book we'll be fine yeah. <laughs> I don't think they'd have bought it if they thought it was yeah. going to be like that. We're not going to overstay our welcome with our listeners, but have you got any final thoughts or comments from each of you of your perceptions of the first book? I think I think what made the difference for me is the rivers. It's just such an inspiring idea that doesn't get laboured at all, that these the, the rivers are people and they have extraordinary characters and they have extraordinary relationships and they fight like cat and dog and they're rivers. I think for me I think what really made it was all the different connections the sort of the reality the fantasy the magic the brutal side of police work and also the past to the present in fact can I just read you a very short quote mm. which I, I think summed up how I felt about it really so it was when this uh, a police whistle was blown on Bow Street and it says, for a moment, I felt a connection like a vigium with the night, the street, the whistle and the smell of blood and my own fear with all the other uniforms of London down the ages who wondered what the hell they were doing out so late. So I thought that it was the sort of serious side of uh, what had been going on, but also the reality of the police thinking, 
what sort of job are we doing? Yeah. Which mm. is a sort of thread that's followed from the police long, long ago to modern policing. And that sort of summed it up for me, I think. It was all about connections that were made. So, having read the first book, are you interested in reading book two and being involved in our next podcast? Definitely. I'm definitely invested in those characters now and I want to see yeah. what's going to happen next. Jenny? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, for a lot of the same reasons. I, I, uh, so much about it I loved, but I also need to know more about Nightingale, more about Molly, more about the agreement and whatever Etrasaur or whatever it was they keep talking about. Is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Germany, Etersburg? Etersburg, I think, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. that's a bit mm. dark, isn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. That's why I thought it'd be really more interesting for the listeners to have a combination of two people who have read the series before and two who haven't. Obviously, now we're going to head off into our secret library to uh, talk a bit about spoilers. So we'll say farewell to you at this point. <laughs> yeah, thank you, guys. and it's thanks really for joining. Thank us. you for organising it thank all. You. Thank yeah. you. It was fun. Bye. 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 Before Jan and Jenny and our new readers who are listening leave us at this point. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please send your thoughts about Rivers of London by email to follypodcast at gmail.com or leave a comment on our website, thefollycast.com. The links are in the show notes. We'll have a feedback section in the next episode. The Follycast theme you've been hearing is London is Inspired by Cutwater, Thanks to them for allowing us to use it and you can hear the song in full at the end of this podcast. We hope you join us for the next episode covering Moon Over Soho. But now it's time for Richard and I to head into the secret library at the Folly and discuss spoilers aplenty up until the seventh novel, Lies Sleeping. So as we mentioned, we're only going to discuss up until the penultimate novel that's been released, Lie Sleeping, for the simple fact that False Value, which came out recently, I'm supposed to be giving the hardback version of to Margaret to read, but with the lockdown, it's trapped in my flat. So I'm going to have to be also careful not to reveal too much about what's in that book. But um, I think the first thing that really I felt coming back to rereading it is how much this book, Rivers of London, feels definitely like the the first episode of a tv show almost like a you know a feature length episode setting up a new series how much it seeds in i mean i know you you notice quite a few things that are often referred to which won't mean much to new readers but will crop up in later books yes i mean i was quite surprised at how many of the characters that pop up in further books are in there. Dr. Waleed, for example, is has a much more prominent role in books later on, but is important. But also Frank Caffrey, who I didn't even remember was in the first book, actually has two scenes with the bit with the vampires in Purley. And then towards the end, he's one of the soldiers that is guarding the folly. And I was thinking, that's a bit weird. He was a TA in the army. But again, that's quite interesting in terms of a character who I didn't even figure was in until book three Mm. is actually in that first book. I also underestimated, having not read the book for about four years, how important a role Beverly had. I knew she was important towards the end. And I knew, obviously, in further books, she is not in book two, but subsequently quite important. But I didn't realise how prominent she actually is flowing that's the mixed metaphor because she's a river, but running through that book, but how important she actually is for a lot of the plot devices in that book as well. And also I forgot that Tyburn was in that book too. But yeah, it is quite interesting how many things are planted there that are picked up in lots of subsequent books, like with Molly as well, that you don't necessarily figure. And I got to the end of the book and I thought, oh, that looks like a scene out of book two. And actually it isn't. It is in book one, but it actually is echoing something that's going to be picked up in Moon Over Soho. Yeah, it's interesting when you reread these, um, 
it gives you that slightly different perspective. But I know sometimes when you read Kindle books, they put the first chapter of the next book at the end as a teaser. And when yes. I got to that little scene with the guy in the hospital bed who'd had a bad bad Experience. encounter in a yes. nightclub, I was thinking, oh, is this is this the start of the next book? But then yes. of course it wasn't. So um, when you read it at the time, you didn't realise the significance of it. And it's kind of hinted that you're supposed to think it's Molly up to no good. I, I agree with you about... Beverly, I, I didn't realise she was in it quite so much. And I was much more aware this time of how little Leslie is in the second half of the book for obvious reasons, because yes. anything she'd be saying, you would be potentially not her saying it. So Beverly definitely not quite takes over as a sidekick, but sort of fills that void without you being too aware. Yeah, I was going to say, because the, towards the end of the book, Nightingale's incapacitated. Again, she has a not that sort of psychic role, but somebody that he can talk about what's going on, hmm. uh, which you do need as a narrator. And obviously, close to the end, Nightingale's in hospital. There's a few a few other things I picked up on. I mean, we both noticed the... And actually, I think Jan mentioned that but what's this Ettersburg thing? Yes, um, which is planted which, all the way through. And, yeah. and a lot more references to the, the war and the vampires than yes. certainly I remember at the time. I think part of it is that when you come back to reread a book and I have to say I hardly ever reread books because there's just so many books out there you yeah. feel almost a bit guilty about rereading but it's a bit like watching it re-watching a, a good tv show in that because you know the vaguely the plot yes you tend to focus more on the writing and the details and the characterization and enjoy those because you're not desperately speed reading it to turn the page to see what happens so I guess you, you're more likely to pick up on well, I, I didn't pick up in the first book that Nightingale looks... I always had in my head, maybe because I didn't read it properly, that I thought Nightingale was about 50-ish, 60-ish. Mm. So when they say he's in mid-40s, I was like, OK. But then I think because his costume, the cane and the tweed coat and everything else like that, is of a era that's slightly older. It was only when I went back and thought, gosh, yes, he is, because obviously he's quite active and does quite a lot of stuff. But I was like... Oh, OK. So again, you know, you just sort of in your head, you have a vision and then you don't read what you think you actually see in front of you type thing. Yeah. It, uh, again, one. I mean, one of the challenges I had reading the, the whole series is that it's not like a TV programme where the next episode is next week. I know you read Moon Over so Soho quite quickly after yes. Rivers of London. I didn't. I put there's probably about a year gap in which, in which space I'd read loads of other books. So when I came back to it, I I, I didn't I couldn't remember who Ash was, no. um, or why he was there, or yeah, because you, you haven't quite got the immediacy of the and you don't get the previously on Rivers of London as the first chapter or something. Understandably, um, so that that could be a bit of a challenge. Which hopefully rereading it, I'm going to pick up a lot more of the the continuity than I did reading it you know 18 months apart on first read yes and I also said to you I didn't think Peter's father was in the first book but I was wrong yeah. he has he has a scene at the end when Peter has nowhere else to go and he goes home for a night and actually you think yeah. yeah and again that's a, the purpose of that really I think is queuing up what's going to happen in book two because it serves no purpose I mean the flat could have been empty and he could have been there but it's obviously planting a seed for book yeah. two so a, a few other things popped out to me some of them big, some of them small. The the whole travelling back in time in the last yeah. um, couple of chapters really is totally revisited in um, at the end of Lie Sleeping. And I, I have to confess, when I read Lie, Lie Sleeping a couple of years ago when it came out, I'd completely forgotten about that section in the first book. So yeah. now I, I'm, I'm going to have more appreciation of how that whole process worked. And then the other clear circularity if you think that this is the, the the season opener and if you think of I, I tend to think of lies sleeping as the end of series one like the season finale for obvious yeah. reasons that they also revisit quite extensively they revisit the actor's church yes um, they do because if you remember in Lie Sleeping, there's mentions of St Paul's, which they assume is St Paul's Cathedral, but actually it turns out to be about right near the start of the very first book. Yeah. 
when Isis tells Peter not to go into the water with yes. Beverly. Yes, I remember um, that, yeah. It, it's, um, and, and afterwards, uh, Peter says, Beverly wanted me to go swimming in her river and I had no idea what that meant, except no. Isis had warned me against doing it. I had a strong suspicion you didn't shag a daughter of the River Thames without getting out of your depth, literally. Well, of course, no. in Fox Summer... Summer, we, yeah, that happens, find... doesn't it? Yes. Uh, and the whole thing about not having, uh, being a beholden or eat, drink, eating the cake or drinking the tea and that sort of sense of mm. enchantment by the rivers. But yeah, you can see he obviously must, well, in my mind, having read the first book, he must have thought this is a potentially a series of four or five books and I'm setting up potential leads. Although when you listen to the Guardian podcast, they ask him about how he came up with the idea of the first book and he just thought, well, Peter's dad, was involved in jazz and how can I set this in yeah. Soho and that wasn't necessarily the case there but it is interesting in terms of how many of the characters are there yeah. to be developed later on it doesn't that's I mean obviously you'd have to speak to the author but it doesn't necessarily mean they intended to use them and when you speak to someone like Stephen Moffat or when you see him being interviewed he tends to point out that sometimes he'll just put things in because he might come back to them later they're useful things to have mm -hmm. rather than knowing at the time exactly what would happen you know the, the, the characters kind of lead them lead the author through what happens so it's I think we've got yeah. quite a few spoilers to sit there I think but that's I think... A, hopefully that's enough spoilers for the long-term listeners to yeah uh, but I, I think it's happening. interesting if you are a long-term fan I think going back and reading that first book you begin to see how that sort of story arc for the rest of all the books sort mm. of starts to play itself out and how he sort of planted lots of different um uh routes that he can take for even in one of the novellas which hasn't got either Peter Grant or Nightingale in that's set in Germany there are things in that first book that then get picked up in that book too yeah definitely well I'd, I'd, what I'd say is if you if you are hopefully if you're listening to this section of the podcast you are someone who has read most of the series I would recommend going back and rereading the first one I think it really has uh, um, made me appreciate a lot more about the thought gone into the structure of the whole thing but uh, anyway okay anyway. well that just about wraps things up for us and we'll be back in four weeks time discussing book two so we'll see you then. Finally, to play us out, we're going to hear the full version of London is Inspired by Cutwater. And you can find out more about them in the show notes. So London is Inspired by Cutwater. <laughs> Suggestions I haven't got a clue 